Hello everyone, this is W, host of the High Art on the Edge page. In today's video, you will get a chance to hear Barkles Giorgio and I continue our entertaining and educational analysis on The National. In part two, we focus our attention on their albums, Trouble Will Find Me, Sleep Well Beast, I Am Easy to Find, First Two Pages of Frankenstein, and Laugh Track. In addition, we pick our favorite non-album tracks, as well as rank all 10 of their albums. So, grab yourself a drink, sit back and relax, and enjoy our examination of this band's incredible work. Feel the mighty pull of the national. Well, back with me again is Barkles Giorgio, as he was my co-host for part one, and will be my co-host for the next hour, hour and a half. So let's bring him in. Barkles, how are you? W, good to see you again. I, I'm very well. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Another toast to round oh, two. It would, it would be entirely appropriate. Uh, cheers. <laughs> cheers to you. Cheers. <laughs> okay, so um, you have decided you want to go through the RO grinder with me again in terms of uh, going down the rabbit hole, the national, which I greatly appreciate you being my co pilot. Um, our first episode uh, we're focused on albums one through five, and now we're going to do subsequent albums six through ten. Very much the same way, we'll pick a bronze, silver, and gold medal track. And of course, we can discuss lyrics, concert experiences, merch, whatever you want in between. So why don't we get started? And um, oh, and by the way, after this conversation, we're going to share our three non-album tracks. And then we're going to give you a ranking of all 10 albums, what we thought from uh, bottom shelf to top shelf. Here we go. So we ended up um discussing an album called high violet which many people consider their their uh watermark moment the moment they completely arrived and we're going to move on from that album to their sixth album this is 2013 trouble will find me and this is where i feel as though the band started bringing in more guests along St. Vincent, Sharon Van Etten. And this is um, a body of work that really is discomforting. And why do I say that? Just look at the album cover, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So from that moment on, when you look at that album cover and then you start exploring this album, you really get into this dark terrain and some really unsettling themes, discomforting. So before you give me your bronze medal track here, um, Barkles, just real quickly, I've got a question for you. How would you describe this album in three words? That is your classic <laughs> question, I've realized. <laughs> um, I think troubling, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, unsettling for sure. Um, but I think also it's so rich. Um, I think that at this point after High Violet, they, they could do anything. It probably brought them a bit of freedom and space to do whatever they wanted and from what i heard that the songs actually came quite quickly for this album um and there was such huge anticipation you know globally from existing fan base and new fan base but i i think that richness there's such a there's such a confidence to the songwriting um I, and it's breathtaking and I, and what a fascinating record to okay well articulated thank you so much 
let us get started right away into your bronze medal track from the album Trouble Will Find Me. Trouble Will Find Me. I, I think what you what you touched upon with the album cover there was quite interesting. I I didn't notice this for a long time, but where she, where her eye is actually looking, she's kind of looking right out of the corner of her eye, which really adds to the unsettling kind of feeling. It, bronze, I think, has to be for me, Don't Swallow the Cap, um, which was one of the singles. Um, and it's... It, for me, it kind of foregrounds perhaps that Springsteen influence that they have as a band. Definitely sounds like Arcade Fire. Um, I think, and who doesn't love huge, bombastic, propulsive, driving, energetic, indie rock bangers? That's half the reason you go to the Nashville. Um, but I think this song swoops, soars, shimmers. Um, it has amazing strings that really help the song take flight. They are getting so good at melding string section with rock music. Yeah. It's it's almost so subtle that sometimes you don't even notice it because it's the strings are almost part of the emotion of the song. And that, I think that's down to the, the Desners and their incredible array of collaborators. Um, but I think what you're hinting at with the album cover and your themes where where Matt sings, uh, I have only two emotions, careful fear and dead devotion. You know, we've talked about tension in national songs and I think that lyrical um, context and tension is at the heart of this song and it's at the heart of this album, absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna throw my goal, my bronze medal uh, track over to this song and we're gonna bring back a line or an animal from a previous album. Bats and buzzards in the sky, alligators in the sewers. I don't even wonder why. I hide among the younger viewers. I huddle with them all night long. The worried talk to God goes on, but I stay down with my demons. Holy shit, Barkles. <laughs> so. The last time I saw him, not this time a couple of weeks ago in San Francisco, but the previous time, I don't remember them playing that track. So when they came to San Francisco two weeks ago and those opening chords, I was like, oh my God, is this Demons? And it was. His vocal work is phenomenal. The lyrics are brutal. It's it's an album, it's a song that jabs at me every time. And I can tell you, it is probably a song that I avoid hearing because it, it takes me back to a moment that was very um, impactful in my life, not in a positive way. And I can relate to what this man is saying. And it's kind of why I love brooding music. You know, Mark Koslick, Nick Cave, um, you know, Matt Berninger, Leonard Cohen, I feel as though they are offering up a lens into this troubled world we are, who we are as men. And all of the staggering contradictions that come with that. Okay, we go from bronze to silver. What is your silver medal? Uh, this it is incredibly difficult for an album that's pretty much faultless. Um, yeah. And like you say, it's so sharp. The production's so clean. Um, I, I, it feels like a the monochrome of the artwork, and it feels that feels like the album to me. I, I think I have a slight synesthesia, and I, I do feel kind of colours with albums, and this feels like quite a monochrome, clean silver, black and white album. Um, I'd have to go with Graceless for my silver. Um, you know, we've talked about indie rock bangers. I mean, this is indie rock banger par excellence. You know, it's it's early. That guitar is just incredible. Like early U2 meets Joy Division. Um, it's, it's about as perfect as an indie rock banger that I've ever heard. Um, but also it taps into that deep sadness and romance and trouble that we've been talking about. And um, is there a powder to erase this? And uh, 
I think Matt is really singing about um, this deep, deep, profound wish to just forget and get rid of a memory of this person or this person in total. Um, and I think it, it builds and builds to that incredible climax. And the, I think Brian's drumming is just incredible. Like you, you, you talk about how and why this, this band are different and why they, why they stand out. And I think the more that you hear his drumming, and I've rediscovered that on listening. He's he's one of the great rock drummers ever. Like the the bit that gets me is um, that that image and metaphor at the end where he says Matt sings all of my thoughts of you bullets through rotten fruit, um, oh, and it's just like uh, for me that image is it's, it's they're such a band that has an intersection of design, art, film everything and music everything and that line just it, it reminds me of those slow motion videos that you see where there's there's a bullet going in slow motion like through a rotten fruit and you see it explode and the idea that the idea that a thought could be a bullet that just explodes this this perfect thing that is rotten um yeah, I mean, you can unpack this song for days. <laughs> you really could. I love it. Solid, yeah. solid pick. All right. So we know there are some national songs that just the tickling of the ivory keys, it almost brings you to a tear. There are many examples of this, but this song is definitely one of them. It stops me dead in my tracks, wherever I am. It makes me very ruminative, introspective, and it makes me really sponge up that emotional, that pathos that Matt is so good at with his vocals, along with everyone, all the accompaniment. And uh, I love these lyrics. They can all just kiss off into the air. They can all just kiss off into the air. And then, like, there's more to that, of course. But yes, my silver medal has to be hard to find. What an amazing, an amazing closing track. I can just see people weeping. I, I just get a sense of the melancholy. Um, I don't believe I've ever seen them play that song live. I'm not sure how I'd respond to it, but yeah, inside it leaves me blubbering. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, it reminds me of, well, this whole album is so deeply arduous for me. It's um, it's like a, a, a wrecking ball because of, uh, I was going through severe, severe, um, experiences in my life that were so extreme. This is the album that really grounded me and threw me into a frenzy. And so that song is very near and dear to my heart for private reasons. But yeah, that's, that's my silver metal track. Yeah. Oh, oh, I, I kind of, I just talking, I was like, God, do I want to even talk about this? Because <laughs> um, I'm going to get. I I think I think you tap into a really interesting point about personal experience at a concert, though. Um, I think I think I think <clears throat> this is why it's so important to have like gig etiquette because yes. you you might not be a particular fan of whatever song is being played at the moment, but there could be somebody right next to you whose life depended on that song. And they might be going through a very personal epiphany or revelation or catharsis. And if you're there yakking with your friend about some nonsense, um, you're ruining their moment, you know. And I, I think, I think, yeah, that's very telling. I mean, I love that song, and it's 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 not one that I would always instantly pick as one of my favorites. But like, yeah, if you if I was standing next to you at a concert and I could see you were in the moment, you know, I, it's important to have that respect for someone else. Um, I'm. I have to go with Sea of Love um, be because I, I've literally picked three bangers here. 
Um, and as much as this album is has its slow, beautiful, introspective moments, when it bangs, it bangs so hard and so good that it it kind of they're real peaks of indie rock. Um, I think that um, apparently they recorded Sea of Love live in one take, so the the whole song is is recorded live. Um, which makes me love it even more because it sounds like that. I thought this sounds so good. And and also, doesn't that just tell you how good they are together, <laughs> how tight they are, how much they know each other, how confident they are to do that? Um, I mean, you know, this song in particular, um, the drumming is just so cool. It's just like, it's a really simple idea. But then when the drumming breaks and it goes into those those real kind of fills, it's kind of that's what brings the emotion. I mean, if you, you, you know, you talk about drumming as uh, as bringing an emotion to the song. And I think, oh, there's just so many national songs where he is critical to that. Um, and the tension and the release of the drumming is key to what makes this song great. The, the backing vocals, the harmonies, I don't think we've kind of touched yeah. on that. They're so beautiful, um, and those kind of like, yeah, it's 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 a real rock trope. And but there's... we've talked, we've touched upon it. But Matt Berninger's phrasing is so good. You have this driving, propulsive song, and um, that that line of like, "Hey Joe, um, I'm sorry I hurt you, but they say love is a virtue, don't they?" And that that final like little kiss off of "Don't they?" It's it, you can interpret that in two ways. It's you know, it's it's just so profoundly sad and moving, and everybody will hurt somebody at some point in their lives. And Matt Burningham knows that, and he's done that, and everybody's done it, and it, and that line just nails it. But the line that kills it for me, and and it's just a killer line, is you know, what did Harvard teach you? Um, yeah. You, you can you can you can talk you could you can interpret that in so many ways all right you get to pick my gold okay i'm sensing you're going for the more somber reflective <laughs> which, introspective i think you i think you might go for i need my girl maybe mm -hmm. that's a good pick so i'm going to read you this quote this is about the um artwork here Mm. Um, Bo Yun Yun, the cover art called Fragmentation. There are unlimited numbers of reflections of truncated legs, torsos, and arms, which usually connect and create a linear pattern. This provocative image of the depersonalized body is juxtaposed with the development of modern science that enables people to alter their appearance through surgeries or cloning. Okay, so now why am I bringing this up? Again, it goes back to this very startling image. And this song to me is that image. So when they were here at Stanford Palo Alto, right before COVID hit, this is the moment that Matt had the 100 yard <laughs> mic cord and he went out into the audience. Everyone was so fixated. They grabbed their phones. They tried to find him. I was keeping my eyes right on the stage. I wanted to see what they were doing. And I had my eyes shut. This is that. All of a sudden, I hear that more of this kind of chaos in this seat, in this pit. All of a sudden, I hear this man screaming, screaming. He's two feet away from me. And it was Matt. And I just kind of had my arm right next to him. And we were, we were bunny hopping. And that is the song, Graceless. Oh, <laughs> God. Um, it's, can I, can I add something that I forgot? Right. Yes. Yes. And, and it was, it was only when I, I was doing a deep dive in preparation for this conversation. And, the song title itself is obviously graceless is obviously it's obviously a, a word and a concept in its own right if you when you listen to the lyrics he's actually talking about grace which could be a person right 
and it's you know there's a long history of Matt naming um, characters and people. You know, you got Jennifer, you got Karen, all kinds, all kinds of people. Um, if if there if there's a power to erase this, you know, if you if you want to forget Grace, you would be graceless. Um, and that I again like it was just one of those little nuggets of like I'd never thought about that in ten years until the other day. Um, but the idea that actually Grace could be a person, and if you wanted to forget Grace, you'd be Grace less. That, that's another great point. And this is a, a shining example of when that song has full restraint and you want it to go off the rails, and it does. And he goes off the rails. And it just, it, it ascends and it goes on the escalator of that sound. And um, this is a song I cannot stress enough for people that love going to concerts and experiencing a, a one, two, maybe three songs that change your viewpoint. This is that song. So, yeah, it has to be that one. Uh, I can. All right. We are going to leave. Trouble will find me. And we're going to drive on to another into another lane uh 2017 this is sleep well beast and this is an album that for all of its accolades i believe it won a grammy it was on many critics top 50 lists thank you for holding it up um it's a huge sweeping battlefield of some political corporate frustrations and kind of jabbing, of course, and we know who they're kind of jabbing at at that time, at the uh, the present there. Um, the uh, artwork, always interesting, and produced by the Destin brothers. So, of course, I'm talking about Sleep Well Beast. All right, what is your bronze metal track? Uh, okay, before I reveal bronze um don't you think you should send troubled pep in my step to uh matt matt burninger at gmail.com um <laughs> i think I, th I think he'd really appreciate that one <laughs> um okay bronze um so i i i really rate this record a lot um I'm going to go for the very final track, Sleep Well Beast. Um, now, I don't know how they made this song. Um, it's very, very unique in their canon. Um, it circles back. It circles back to the opening song because it speaks of a hallway. It speaks of gin, which are both mentioned in the first song. Nobody else will be there. Um, there's a nice circular nature to it because of that. Also, I Will Destroy You is one of the lyrics, which is also a song title. So this feels for me like quite a key song for the album. And also it's the titular album track. And it's, oh my God, it's, it's a completely fascinating oral experience. I love listening to it on headphones. Um, and I, I can't think how long it must have taken to put together um, because it's fascinating. Um, yeah there's there's a the, the kind of like you said the electronic kind of um uh flourishes and clicks and bleeps it really it almost sounds like a fortet track it's um i think that um when it when it kind of um uh describes like um the kind of end of a party and it sounds like they're almost reaching that point in the narrative story where they're ready to go to bed. Um, he speaks of her at the end of the party with white wild eyes and pouring gin inside a teacup. So you still have this specificity of like, and it's it's a couple that are kind of not in a good place, I would say. Um, but it's um, the music for me and the sounds there's a real willingness to experiment. Um, the guitars sound like these kind of metal elephants who are trumpeting. 
Um, I think I think that feeds in feeds into the image of like the beast, the sleep well beast. Um, but it's a troubling song. The lyrics are fascinating. I mean, I've I've spent weeks trying to decode and work out the lyrics, like who is speaking, who's he talking to. You know, it's it's a real complex work of art. Um, and um, I think that it's a fascinating piece of the National Jigsaw. Um, I'm going to go with this track. I don't know, actually, I'm going to try something new here. Can you hear this, actually? And just let me know if you can. Yeah, so we're talking about the opening chords to the piano and the... Um, and I feel as though maybe I am kind of in that mindset, not sure. But Born the Bag, track number five, is my bronze medal. Crushed on the train, we stand by the window, sweat through the hard parts of June. We hugged it out, ducked it on purpose, nothing else I needed to do. I was born to beg for you. I think it, I think that's kind of self-explanatory. This was hard for me because there are a lot of great gold, uh, bronze medal tracks, but it's kind of that repetitive uh, homage to his vocal work and what he's so, so... Man, if they had like a Hall of Fame just for vocal work, <laughs> he'd definitely be up on that platform. Um, and I love the lyrics. Uh, I cry, I crawl, I do it all. Tea kettle love, I do anything. I cry, I crawl. And then New York is older and it's changing its skin again. He's changing his skin again. He's constantly changing that. So that is my bronze medal track. All right. From bronze to silver. <laughs> um, so my my top two is actually very easy because I, for me, there are two huge strand standout tracks on this album um so i'm gonna go with the opening song nobody else will be there um and i think that um i touched upon it in our previous chat i think they do opening album tracks so well and i was so hungry for this album when it came out and there's um there's a there's a BBC Radio 6, which is like our most popular station for 20, 30, 40, 40 year old people in the UK. And they do a live version in the studio. And it's it's jaw dropping. You can watch it on YouTube and it's it's basically a bunch of dudes in the room with instruments. But what they conjure up is, you know, I. I it floors me that at this point in their career they're still writing songs this good and it, it sounds like it those clicks and the little echo it sounds like a lonely cold New York I mean it literally sounds like that it sounds like they're in an alleyway they're on a stairwell um you can almost hear the snow falling in the song you know um and the way that Matt sings it has this kind of hushed intimacy um lisa hannigan is doing the backing vocals which and i think until i listen to it on headphones you 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 may not even notice it you know but when you listen on headphones and you turn it up her backing vocals really make the track it's almost it's, it's almost the partner in the song is like is there with him and she's you know they, they're having this intimate moment in the hallway and i think the backing vocals just bring that idea that narrative idea to the fore Lisa Hannigan will play a huge part on I Am Easy To Find, which is, a, you know, a very interesting take on their female vocal partner direction. But there is, this song is unbearably painful and sad. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like the most amazing short story by Richard Yates that you've ever read. You know, it's, it's, um, I, I think that, it, it it has a, a a somberness that builds to what I what I've what I've come to call the turn in the song, which is that incredible moment 
when it, it feels like it's sinking, it's sinking. And then Matt Berninger comes in with the Hey Baby. And in the background, you know, Matt's vocal is soaring, pleading, rising, Hey Baby. In the background, there's this descending string that is the most saddest thing I've ever heard. And pair, pairing that with his vocal is genius. It's that that's the tension you know you talk we talked about tension in national songs and that is it in in one moment and I, I don't think it can get any sadder than um where were you back then when I needed you um it's like all of all of this the sadness in a relationship and the feeling of being let down and things are not working out the way you hoped um but it's yeah what a phenomenal song my silver metal track is um my faith is sick and my skin is thin as ever i need you alone goodbyes always take us half an hour <laughs> now we just go home yes it has to be nobody else will be there i mean it's 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 a great table setter for our first track. It's so deeply effective in its approach and the way that um, wants you to, okay, strap in. This is gonna be turbulence here. And I feel as though they never manipulate the listener. And there are moments you can, you're like, okay, they might get a little too corny here or whatever. But man, they just know when to rain it at the right time. Um, I I love the layers uh, that get textualized inside that song. Yeah, that was that was originally my gold medal track. Long, long way. My gold gold track is Empire Line on this song on this album. Oh, wow. um, I think Empire Line is completely unique in their canon. Um, I it feels like a short film. It, I when I'm when I'm listening to it, I can visualize every moment. The images are so clear. You're you know. Um, it, lit, it throbs and it pulses almost with a kind of Steve Reich kind of minimalism throb. I, it feels a bit like music for 18 musicians. Um, I think that when you, when you were speaking um, about Born to Beg, they talk about a train in the lyrics. And I think that links in really nicely with this song because this song sounds like a train. It sounds like a train journey. Uh, I, I haven't heard many songs that will conflate image and sound and moment and story in in one perfect song. And for me, this is just a, an incredibly perfect song. It's you know, who you you are in the carriage with these with this couple, you know, and he his partner's asleep. Um, and while she's been asleep, there are there are falling white flowers. There are ice in all the trees, and it that sounds that feels like this. You know, it's it feels like they're on some wintry journey to upstate New York somewhere, um, and you are you are this kind of spirit who's hovering in the carriage, listening in to this couple and what's happening. Um. So. We've talked ad, ad nauseum about uh, great intros to their songs and phenomenal, phenomenal, indelible outros, and particularly last third of their songs. And sometimes they have the restraint and sometimes they go off the rails. And this song is the, the last third of this song. This whole song is very artful to me. It's so well composed. It's so well put together. It's masterful. And I'm going to have to say that I've been tapping that table too. <laughs> I've, been hopping, I've been hopping the drink. <laughs> There's a line that goes all the way. 
And yes, Empire Line is my gold medal track. Oh, man. Yeah, and we, I don't need to belabor the point, but particularly the that last third of the song, there's nothing mm. like it. There's no. nothing like it. No. And there's nothing... That's we've talked we talked about this in part one. Sure, there we can hear some influences in their songs, but that and for this band, I feel as though they completely sit on their own island. They don't sound like anybody else. So I am easy to find is our next album. Barkles. Bronze metal track. There we go. Um, I love this album. Um, Jesus. Yeah, this was, for me, this was a real lockdown album. Um, and I spent a lot of time with this record for that exact reason that you say is so sprawling. Um, and I think that willingness to experiment is what I love about this band because this is this. I, they've they've always used females vocalists so well and in so interesting ways to bring so much emotion, and the idea of just really collaborating with female singers and foregrounding that on so many songs pays so many dividends because oh my god, the Nationals' music really lends itself to incredibly impassioned female vocals. Um, I think this is a staggering record, like really staggering. Um, and I'm still unpacking it and finding new things. It's, it's a it's a gorgeous record. So bronze is in so hard, it's so hard. Like um, it's, it's a really, it's, it's, it's an album that you can find a lot to love in, but I'm going to go with The Pull of You um, because, uh, number one, Lisa Hannigan and Sharon Van Etten on the same song. Um, and again, I think this is a real headphones album, and I, I fell in love with this album on headphones. And I, I think the... I, I know headphones makes you sound like, oh, you know, it's just like, can't you just listen to it? But I sometimes there's just there's just things you can't hear you know and there's things that i never noticed and when you listen to an album on headphones um it's it's often almost like opening a door to you know a room that you already knew was there and there's finding all kinds of new stuff in there you know and there's, a, there's a great sufian stevens quote that i came across in an interview once which where it's he said, Matt Berninger sings like your older brother who has a dark side. Nice. And I, I think I think this song really encapsulates that idea. Um, it starts off so romantically with, you know, we're connected by a thread, which is a really ancient concept. Um, it's, a, you know, a very romantic concept. Um, and I like that it's at the heart of this very complex, musically, technologically strange song, you know. Um, and I think that the 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 moment in it when Matt loses it and he his voice really soars, and it combines with the guitar, which is just incredible guitar work. It just it sounds like if Joy if Joy Division had lived to now, I think this is almost like the kind of song that they would be writing. Like it really sounds like a kind of post punk Joy Division, beautiful guitar, and it, when it combines in that precise, the guitar is used so sparingly. So when it comes in, it's it just grabs you, and when Matt sings like maybe we'll talk it out. Um, inside the car like with the rain falling all around it's a real cinematic moment it feels like a moment from a film theme for me in this discussion um the storm the blackout the quiet sea you went running right into it away from me and i'm talking about so far so fast 
Um, that's another song that gives me the chills. That's another song I feel as though um, once she, once her, those beautiful angelic vocal chords kind of chime in, I can, I can get a little weepy eye. Uh, it, it's just a breathtaking song. So I'm going with So Far, So Fast with Lisa Hannigan. Okay, your silver medal. Silver was fairly easy because my gold is, is just my gold, one of my gold national standards for all time. But silver, I'm going to have to go with Rylan. That when, when I Am Easy to Find came out, um, I had one of the great days of my life. Um, <laughs> um, so the day that the album came out, they did a they did a live concert. I think they did one in New York, one in Paris, one in London. And nobody had heard the album. They did like three days um, around the day of the release date. And when they played London, the album hadn't come out yet and they played at the Royal Festival Hall, which is a beautiful classical concert venue. And they basically turned the venue into this giant neon cube that would change color. And they played the whole album in its entirety. No one had heard it. Obviously the gig had sold out because it's the national. The sound was just incredible. They played the whole album in its entirety and then they played like you know what you might consider 10 greatest hits um so i'd had a bottle of wine i was with a friend by the thames a very dear friend so we'd gone into the gig having had a bottle of wine and they played the album and it was i, I hadn't really had that experience before of hearing a whole album in its entirety live before you've even heard it on record and it was still to this day one of the most magical gigs because it's a band you love that you know so well and intimately and yet they're just playing so many songs that you don't know and yes. but then then when they got to rylan i was like oh my god i know this fucking song because i've been listening, to it, <laughs> been listening to it relentlessly for two years um i was emboldened by a bottle of wine and probably two glasses and I ran to the front of the stage. And uh, uh, you can do that in this venue. And I was the only person dancing. Um, and I was losing my shit because I love this song. And the, the, there's a moment in it when Matt reaches down and shakes my hand. Um, and afterwards, he points at me because I'm kind of drunkenly swooning high on adrenaline and he dedicates Ryland to me because I'm like the only person in the room down the front <laughs> dancing and it's one of the greatest gig moments of my life so for that reason alone it, it would be Ryland but also the music is so great I mean I saw the YouTube clip <laughs> <laughs> um the giddiness uh you're right and that song has tremendous restraint and you also you get a sense of that they also perform that in Colbert, the Colbert show. Mm -hmm. So uh, check that out as well. Yeah, and people went nuts when they announced that I was going to be on the album. And that was finally it. Finally mm -hmm. it, it hatched, and people were ready for that. All righty. So I keep going back to this Palo Alto Stanford concert, and this is the track where for my silver medal. Um, I can't remember. They had come off some banger and they just kind of brought the crowd to a silent still and he picked up his wine and he was a little tipsy, but definitely in control of himself. And uh, it just kind of brought the audience to a, a, a hush. And I have said time and time again that this band continues to take a risk. So I thought for this conversation, for better or for worse, I'm going to take a risk by singing a portion, <laughs> just a smidgen, because <laughs> I want people to still watch this. 
And this is my silver medal track. And I'm off, I'm off key. I don't give a shit. <laughs> so here we go. Make a list, write it down, shave your head, draw a <laughs> mom and dad, the pool is drained, and they're not there. Not in Kansas is my silver medal. When he sang that song, I mean, I liked that song before, but again, when you see it in a live setting, sometimes that can change your entire outlook of a song, and that was that defining moment. You touched on it the very beginning of this episode where uh, concert etiquette. Yeah. There were tons of people at that show. Nobody was talking. I mean, I couldn't hear anything except for him singing. And the, wow. there was these beautiful blue lights on him on the background. And I think this is his greatest phrasing song the way that he is able to pull all of these syllables together and somehow make it all work because i in doing the homework i read that this song was originally like 10 minutes long <laughs> it gobs and gobs of just writing in a, in a diary and i think he was writing this when he was on he was traveling um but it's where you feel like he's so up close. Yeah. Silver medal. And I'm going to pick your gold medal track here from this album. And, um, you know, you had messaged me that uh, you're kind of going on a limb, uh, maybe throwing a curveball here and there. <laughs> And I think this is the album that you were alluding to, but I could be wrong. And I think your gold metal track um, is Roman Holiday. <laughs> you were you were, you were so close. You're so close. I I nearly chose Roman Holiday. Um, <laughs> maybe if only for that um, that that great line of uh, where he refers to to Patty Smith and uh, Robert Mapplethorpe. Um, but my gold track has to be has to be Hey Rosie. Uh, which I I think is 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 kind of not just not just gold. I am easy to find. I think is gold the national, um, and there there's so so many reasons for that. Um, for me, I listening to this song in lockdown and since. Um, it's whenever, whenever I, whenever I try and get a handle on this song or hold it up to the light, it just shifts and it becomes something else. And I think that's that's the sign of a great, great work of art. You know, it's. I, I think I think this is a staggering song. I mean, if it's not a rock song, I mean, it's you know. Spotify keeps throwing this genre at me of chamber pop. Um, and I don't know what chamber pop is. I think it's Sufjan Stevens. I don't know. Um, but I don't know how to genreify this song. And does it even matter? The genre is I am easy to find. That's the genre. Um, but I think the magical secret ingredient to this song is Gail and Dorsey um now on an album where they're bringing in incredible female vocalists lisa hannigan has obviously worked with them in the past and and to majestic effect gail and dorsey you know being the bassist and the vocalist with david bowie when i saw her on the credits i was just like holy holy moly wow um i'd I didn't know. I, I 
I'd seen Gail Ann Dorsey playing with David Bowie, and I didn't know I didn't know that was Gail Ann Dorsey until later. Um, if you if you ever watch David Bowie performing under pressure with Gail Ann Dorsey, who's playing bass and singing, Gail Ann Dorsey is singing Freddie Mercury's parts, and it's under pressure has always been my favorite Queen song by a long way um, for personal reasons. But um, the, the, the majesty and the soul that she brings to that part yeah. is just monumentally life-changing. And God bless YouTube. This is why YouTube exists, is so that future generations can experience great works of art, I think. And oh my God, the magic in this song is all Gail and Dorsey. I love Matt Berninger and he kills it. But I am waiting and waiting and waiting for Gail and Dorsey because um, it, this throbs and it pulses really delicately to start with. But then it changes because there's a, you have this heaviness of the bass rumble. There's a huge weight of heaviness and these kind of really flickering guitar licks that sound like flames bursting, which mimics her lyrics later on. And I I think it's an astonishing piece of work. And when when it finally gets to her main solo vocal where she says, I will love you like there's razors in it. And I I, I don't I don't think there's a person alive that cannot be moved by the way she sings it and the lyrics. Um and then to have somebody um, say to you that I, I will love you like a, uh, there's, uh, there's never, sorry, there's never really any safety in it when they're singing about love. And I think it harks back so well to Matt's line of all the very best of us string ourselves up for love. So to contextualize that in, in a canon of work, to have there's never really any safety in it is um everybody's putting themselves out there for love there is no safety in it you know you might get hurt but gail and dorsey's vocal is just like this deep soulful from the from the earth like it's it's so grounding in the song and it's so i've never heard anybody sing like that and i i love it yeah Yeah, no, it's uh, it is an amazing song, and she'll love you like a radiant flame. That's the line I was forgot. <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, the song sounds like a radiant flame for me. It like hey Rosie, it has that pink red hue and a radiant flame. It's a lovely image to connect to the title. Like yeah. Um, thank you for sharing your gold medal. All righty. So I had messaged you earlier today and I said in our today's discussion, I'm going to re re reveal obviously our, my, our gold medal tracks for per album, but I'm also going to reveal my number one national song. Of yeah. all, time. <laughs> all righty. So what is my gold medal track? And now you know this is my favorite national song. <laughs> so there's a, there's a run of songs on this album, which I think is is as fine a run that they've ever put together. So I'm kind of thinking it might be Roman Holiday or Oblivion. So I'm going to go for the Oblivions, maybe. <laughs> okay. So. The first half of this album is quite good. The second half is light years. <laughs> yeah. and I mean that with great respect. The second half of this album is truly astonishing. So this next song for me, this gold medal track, it is, it is, 2020, it is COVID, it is during one of the most heartbreaking, most challenging times of my life. 
it is it, it it's a song that literally forced me into the deep bowels of hell and i enjoyed being in there because as i was on the floor mopping up my own shit i was also cleaning out a lot of my baggage if you will this song's very very um it takes me to the mat every time i hear it and um it has this line in it that is the knockout punch so here is my gold medal track what are we going through wait and see days of brutalism oh. and hairpin turns this is my favorite national song of all oh, time it always will be the video is it's odd it fits it works it's um then he says your ner nervous throat clicks and my spirit swims right to the hook and in the video you can see him being hooking himself yeah. as he's as, as this kind of flittering fish and you go quiet and leave me in the wake of a terrifying look this is the embodiment of a relationship that so many people married or not it makes no difference we've all been there it's the universal language of love and all the pain that comes with it. And I have walked my streets around here many times at night and I, I see people's lights on. And I've often thought while listening to that song, I wonder how much brutalism is going on in that house. I wonder how much fighting and tension. So Hairpin Turns is uh, my gold medal track. And uh, I almost don't want to hear them play it live. I don't think they play it very often. Um, I think it just needs to sit in this four-chambered heart of mine and just kind of um, coagulate and just swim and bob up and down however it wants. I, but I think seeing it live... I don't want to hear people talk behind me. I don't want anything to, to mess it up. <laughs> and of course, we're talking about this year's uh, album, ninth album, first two pages of Frankenstein. And uh, according to this band, they feel revitalized, recharged. They were kind of out of that conceptual album, uh, that the, the, the ripple effect, the wake of... Um, I'm easy to find. And now this has kind of this airy feel to it. It feels like they've kind of gotten their breath back. Um, and it's a great, great album in return for all of us. And of course, they brought back some heavy hitters, including a woman by the name of Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> um, London Contemporary Orchestra. And out of the writer's block we go and into some great inspiration. So we're going to go with a uh, bronze metal track. What is yours for first two pages of Frankenstein? Yeah, this was a real, I was so happy when they came back. And like you said, I think we'd all been, we'd all been going through whatever we'd been going through individually and uh, the idea that yeah we'd come back collectively as music fans to share and enjoy an album release again it really brought home what we'd lost and and you know how important music had ever had been for everybody in that period um and yeah i was so excited when this album came out um my bronze is going to be grease in your hair um which I think is a really fascinating song for them. Um, there is so much going on musically. I think it's one of the most musically interesting songs they've done. 
and it has an energy and a propulsion. It has strange, obdurate, weird images and lyrics, um, things that I really love in songs. Um, and it builds and builds and builds, and he has such wonderful vocal phrasing in it. Um, and that that idea of um, when he sings, like, you give me such a future feeling. And there's something about that line which um, gives me kind of hope and, and made me coming out of COVID and lockdown, that idea of a future feeling. Um, I think for a long time, everyone was living in the present moment day to day, and we didn't know what the future would look like. We didn't know what we were going to come out of. And even now, when I hear, hear him sing it, like, you give me such a future feeling, I just, I'm straight back in kind of COVID lockdown and, <laughs> and, and thinking of, like, hope and the future. And... And you know what it was? It was bands. It was music that gave me such a future feeling. Um, and when I when I heard him sing this song, and every time since, I don't know why it's really tapped into hope for me. And um, such wonderful drumming. Oh my god! I mean, I wish I could play drums. Like it, it the, the drumming on this track just brings so much emotion to the song. Great what pick. Okay. Um, so we got to go back to first opening tracks. And uh, oh my goodness, Once Upon a Poolside. Another weeper. <laughs> Another weeper. Just those opening chords. And I think Sufian plays on the, is on this track. Yep. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, again, it's like, okay, we're back. We're going to, um, throw a, 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 a song at you that I love how they just don't start out with like a graceless. It's no, they're going to just start off with this kind of slow ballad piece. Um, but I love when he says, I follow you everywhere while you work the room. I don't know how you do it. Tangerine perfume. And that reminds me of Lemon World, his use of fruit. We talked mm. about that. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's a great opening track. So I'm going once upon a pool side. All right, silver medal. Silver medal is um it was quite tricky, but then um i take myself back to when it came out and eucalyptus is it's, it's just so instantly instantly the national and arresting and hooky and perfect also it has one of those vocal narrative stories that you're just instantly with and you get it's such a simple concept uh middle-aged couple dividing up their possessions <laughs> um and as you as you get older and you you know you break up with people and you have to get out of your apartments and start dividing up your stuff you know it's 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 like growing older with this band. Like that's a scenario that I'm sure so many of their fans can relate to. Um, but also what a brilliant song. Um, it's, it, what I love is something that really struck out for me. He's listing, listing, listing things. Um, but then he'll insert a line where he's trying to salvage things. Mm -hmm. Um, so he'll be like, what about the moondrop light? What about the rainbow eucalyptus? But then there's a lot of, he'll slip in a what if. And this song for me is about what abouts and what ifs. And he says, what if I reinvented again? What if we move back to New York? And so those two lines are him trying to salvage the relationship while they're dividing up the stuff. And you can almost hear you can always hear them talking as a couple and it's it's like you're in the room with them and that is something that the national have done so well for 20 years you're 
you feel like you're a presence in the room with these two people. My girlfriend would be very happy that you mentioned Eucalyptus as she <laughs> loves that song. And we both love that song. And when they played it live, and he was very animated in that performance yeah. while singing that song. It was fantastic. Great pick. Absolutely great pick. All right. Well, I have to go kind of back to I Am Easy to Find because in this track, he has some hired help here with a female. And uh, he's gotten to become really good friends with someone by the name of Phoebe Bridgers. <laughs> and of course, I'm talking about this isn't helping. Now, her vocal work isn't too pronounced, um, but it's just enough there that gives it that nice kind of um, ping pong feel. He, he sings and she's going to do her backing work. But I love how this long song just slowly builds and builds, but it never goes off the rails. But would your life be so bad you knew every single thought I had? Um, wounded. He's hurt. And uh, I think he's, ha he's forged a beautiful relationship with Phoebe that, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think they did a video for this song. And I think it's in black and white. I'll have to check that again. But yeah, this was a, kind of a, a slam dunk for me for the silver medal. This isn't helping. All right, gold medal track. Well, um, this really was quite easy. And um, yeah, I am, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm wearing my gold medal track. Here we go. Ah! <laughs> um, I love that shirt. Yeah, it's a great t-shirt. Also, it kind of, when this song happened, it was almost, when I saw the title, I was just like, oh, it's, it's almost like a vindication of all, all of that love that you have as a New Order fan. It's almost like an acknowledgement that it's, you know, of course we love New Order. <laughs> um, and I think that what we talked about in conversation part one about domestic specificity um this song is almost like um another short story this this song is a matt berninger short story um and i think that if you look at look at what's going on in the song um he's saying i keep what i can of you um split second glimpses and snapshots and sounds now if you could extrapolate that into the entire the national oeuvre um they do vignettes they do short stories they do snapshots glimpses like no other band um and he when he says uh, i flicker through i carry them with me like drugs in a pocket um it's it's such a great line because when you're in the middle of kind of breaking up with someone and you're trying to shed all those memories of them i always think about eternal sunshine the spotless mind when like yeah if there was some way of just erasing all the memories of this person you could get over them and that taps into graceless and is there a powder to erase this but in this song there's a real yearning of I keep what I can of you and there's snapshots and glimpses and sounds and um, drugs in a pocket is a great line as well because it implies there's an addiction that I cannot I cannot get rid of you you are like drugs in my pocket I could I could get you out at any time and have a little hit have a little buzz um, um, so for me my gold medal track it took me one time Barkles one time to hear the song and I messaged my girlfriend and I said, holy shit. <laughs> this song, listen to this song, listen to it. And it's a song like Apartment Story, like Graceless. Every time I hear it, I can easily just repeat it five to six times. Um, don't splash apart. Everything changes all jumbled up, wide open spaces fingernail polish water balloon eyes totally honest it is greasing your hair 
Oh my, what an achievement, towering yeah. effort. And when they played that live in San Francisco two weeks ago, I grabbed my girlfriend's shoulder <laughs> and, <I> oh! <laughs> and I went nuts. And there were people just kind of, I don't know if people were too stoned. I was like, move, you fuckers, move. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not? I mean, Scott Devendorf's bass work, phenomenal. Every, every element of that song comes just clashing together in a way that is so melodic. And again, it just builds and builds and builds. And you get this unveiling, this beautiful wall of sound. Mm. And yeah, greasing your hair. God, what a song. Of course, we're talking about, again, we're so blessed to have another release this year. And that is Laugh Track. And this is our final, final discussion on studio albums. We have Justin Vernon, Phoebe Bridgers, Roseanne Cash, the London Contemporary Orchestra again. And then we get some... Um, Production work by Tucker Martin, who all right, bronze medal. Yeah, I I think everybody was surprised when Laugh Track was announced. Um but to to compare it to obviously Radiohead, you know, Re Radiohead recorded the songs on Kid A and Amnesiac at the same time mm -hmm. and then released them one year apart because they thought it didn't hang together as a, as an album or it would be too complex or too long. And there was, there's a really great interview with um, Aaron on a podcast and he hints at, he hints at 10 or 12 tracks and him and Matt were arguing about the track listing for Frankenstein. And they have all these political machinations where they pretend to not like songs in the hope that, you know, somebody else will put them on the record. And yeah, I it's amazing, it's astonishing to me that they recorded all of these songs at the same time. Um, I mean, like I, obviously coming out of COVID, and I guess uh, a flourishing of work and energy. And and Matt, you you read interviews with Matt, and he and you see him on stage now. He seems rejuvenated, and he's obviously part of the the real heart of the band in terms of energy. I think um, so. It was fascinating when this album came out and I'm still diving into it, but my mm. bronze will be the final track, uh, Smoke Detector. Mm, wow. I think it has a killer drum beat, absolute killer drum beat. This is, a, this is an Aaron and Bryce masterclass in guitar for me. Uh, this go, it's a long song, it's like over seven minutes. It goes through so many shifts changes emotions dueling guitars um it comes out of nowhere like smoke you know it, it really does it creeps up on you and what a great line i mean one of the great lines is one of the first ones where he says smoke detector all you need to do is protect her and the idea that you know as a guy like you're the you're the smoke detector like in, in the relationship this is your role you just have to protect her what a, what a fascinating metaphor yeah. um and yeah it's 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 something that i come back to this track a lot it's just the energy and the guitar it's it's really addictive and I think I, this might end up being at some point one, you know, one of my favorite national songs. I think. Um, for me, uh, this was um, this was fairly easy. Uh, number two, this is called "The Deep End," Paul's in pieces, and I mean, there's so many other other tracks I could have picked, but for for me, I don't fully have a grasp of this song. Maybe it's just the melody in there that I really, really enjoy. Um, I feel as though I'm gonna keep growing and learning with this song as so many other, other songs. And I don't think we, we've talked about first tracks. We've talked about last tracks. Mm. I also feel like when bands really think about their number two song and how it kind of starts to carry the momentum 
I feel like this is that song. And um, I'm going to go on a limb here. And I actually think this song would actually fit nicely on Sleep Well Beast. Mm. It's yeah. kind of fun to play songs in different uh, time periods. And uh, it's got a, I know it's, it has an endless quality to it. So, yeah, deep end for me. Silver medal. Silver. Okay. Um, this was actually quite easy for me, this album. I'm still learning this album. I know I'm, I know I'm going to be listening to it for a long time. But they released, they released two singles very quickly. Um, and I was so excited. Um, but... My silver is Alphabet City. Um, I think this song is kind of classic national. It 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 bristles. It has it's a very unique atmosphere. Um, there's a lot of background atmospherics going on. I really I really can't wait to pick up the vinyl and, and listen to it on headphones. Um, but for me, I think it's. It's also tapping into one of those great Matt Berninger um, feelings where he says, uh, all of your lonesomeness kept in your wallet. Nobody notices. Baby, you got this. And it's really unpacking all of those huge national themes that they've won fans for for 25 years. So loneliness keeping it in your wallet. Um, but then Matt gives you that confidence. He says, baby, you got this. It's okay. It's, okay. it's, it's okay to be alone. Um, and then follow the arrows. We'll meet, you know, meet again, meet where we met in Alphabet City. And, you know, as, a, as an English fan of the national, all those little nuggets of Americana and geographical kind of locations are, are, are endlessly fascinating. All right. So for my silver medal, we're going to actually hop on a train. And uh, I think many people will regard this as one of their greatest songs ever. And in live context, it, it, uh, it raised their game. It raised the gold standard. Um, and uh, what if I'd never written the letter? I slipped in the sleeve of the record I gave you. What if I stayed on the C train to Lafayette? What if we'd never met? All these sliding doors. What if I had only just done what you told me and never looked back? What if I only ducked away down the hallway and faded to black? How good is Space Invader? I mean, how good is this song? It, it's, um, I feel as though it's one of those songs that teachers should be using in music uh, and in all classes in some way that they could incorporate into their lessons, particularly English lessons, music mm -hmm. lessons, all that. Um, the way that obviously he phrases it, the way that um, it builds with those lyrics. And the first time I, I heard it, it didn't, I mean, it, it grabbed me, but it didn't. And then I really was like, oh, my God, here is this ending. <laughs> Epic, biblical, Ten Commandments, Ben-Hur-like. <laughs> it was, it's just phenomenal. And uh, I, I've seen people chat about it as literally being one of the greatest national songs ever. Um. So yeah, that is my silver medal track. All righty, your gold medal. Yep. I'm guessing space. I, I'm not going to be about the bush. It's space. It's space, it's space it, baby. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh my god, what a gift! What a gift! As a national fan, is this song? Um, when they were when they were touring in the UK, they went on um, Jules Holland. It's quite a famous BBC live show. And I was excited because that was my first proper chance to hear how they would do it live. And watching that video just just makes you realize what amazing musicians they are. You know, this is this is what it's like to watch musicians who've been playing for 30 years together. 
and the the nuance and the timing and the tightness and for all those reasons all those lyrical reasons that you've just mentioned which are so matt berninger is almost out burning at matt berninger here you know <laughs> lyrically um and but it's the climax it's the climax that i think that points to a new future you know it points to a next national i mean who knew that they had this in them um who knew that all this restraint that we've been talking about they just cut loose they just go off piste they just let let themselves absolutely lose control and i whether whether they wrote this post lockdown whether it's um whether it's a, a, a cathartic release of their collective just frustration at not being together or, or humans not being together i think i think the title space invader is quite interesting um it's you know covid made us realize what it means to be human and have connection and space invader it's just such a a, a dominant image um it's a retro image it's it's a mysterious image and that climax of that song is some of their greatest music i've ever heard and it ha has to be gold i mean i i'm so, i'm so excited to hear what they will do next i mean yeah no it is it's um <laughs> geez and what um that's track number seven on <laughs> yes it's early on yeah that's not like a in baseball terms what they have the 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 um the big number four hitter this mm. is number seven yeah damn what confidence what <laughs> confidence all righty that was my that that should be my gold and i mean these this is just ticky tacky that's it <laughs> so <laughs> um when the album came out i had to go pick up my car which was uh, a good hour hour and 15 minute walk and it was at it was at uh, it was getting some work done so the album came out I put on my headphones and I'm walking to pick up my car and I get to this track and I'm like, wow, this album, is, I'm having a great time enjoying this. And I get to track number 10 and I was like, they did it again. God <laughs> damn the bastards. They got me choked up. They got me choked up. And there's always that one of the maybe one or two moments on the album. They have those songs. And I'm talking about tour manager. Yeah. That is my gold yeah. medal track. I absolutely adore this song. Um, it's it's this, and I, I put here this in my notes. It's it's again, what he's so good at doing is forcing us to look at our own behavior and are we accepting of the um transgressions this inability to take responsibility but within that we still seem to be okay with not taking responsibility with being kind of reckless um and i think that happens in relationships all the time there's there's sometimes in a relationship you have two people they kind of want to go this on the same path, but one person always veers off a little too much because they haven't taken responsibility from their past relationships. And so the tour manager for me is my gold medal track. So right. we are back and Barkles is going to tell us uh, three of his favorite non album tracks. I, I thought it was really important to do this because some of their really magnificent songs are not on albums at all for, for whatever reason, you know, the band decided. Um, but also I think it's, it's just a sign of how good they are that some of these are considered to be not album worthy. Um, so I have three songs that are non-album, which I dearly love to heart. <laughs> um, so I have uh, Exile Vilify, 
which is a song I believe they recorded for some sort of computer game. <laughs> um, literally doesn't sound like anything like that. Um, I would also say number two for me would be Blank Slate, which is the B-side to Mistaken for Strangers. Um, I can see why it's not on mistaken uh why it's not on boxer it doesn't sound like any other song on boxer but oh my god it kicks ass and i could talk about it <laughs> um and then number three which i think every national fan would probably choose potentially would be from the cherry tree ep uh and about today um Considering they put, considering they had all the wine on the Cherry Tree EP and all the wine made Alligator and about today didn't is is still flummoxes me. But those are my three, and I'm happy to talk about them. <laughs> I think those are three great tracks, and um, for me, off the Virginia EP here. Mm. so good so good um my first pick is blanks, <laughs> blanks. <laughs> <laughs> how good is that song oh you know what it has God. you know what it has it has the burning and swa burninger swagger yeah that's what it has that that to me is all swagger and um i just see him in the suit and yeah that's Okay, now this is going to be controversial. I know someone's going to write it. Maybe someone in the comments along. That's not their song. Da, 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 da. But remember, Barkles, I messaged you and I told you my girlfriend and I have been listening to a lot of Nebraska and how yeah. what an amazing body of work. Well, this is one of the national songs. I'm so glad they did this rendition. I would love to see him play it live. There is a YouTube recording of it, so you can watch it. And of course, I'm talking about Bruce Springsteen's Mansion on the Hill. Yeah. Uh, Padma Newsom's um, violin work is extraordinary. It can, it's another tearjerker. And uh, yeah, God, I love that. I love that version. Don't tell the boss this. <laughs> better than the original. <laughs> so, and then, I mean, come on, about today. I um, there's there's an English there's an English poet. Do you know Do you know Philip Larkin? No. Okay. There's a, there's an English poet called Philip Larkin, who really. He was he was writing in the kind of um, 50s and 60s and he uh, he writes about relationships and moments and train journeys and domesticity in, in ways that I think Matt Berninger would love or maybe even loves. I don't know. There's one there's one poem in particular by Philip Larkin is called Broadcast and he's at home. He's sitting by the fire. He's he's listening to a classical concert on the radio, and um, his partner is at the concert, and it's a classical concert. So he's listening to a live radio performance of this classical concert in a venue where his partner is, and he knows she's there, and he's imagining her there in the audience. He's he's thinking of her shoes. He's he's considering their relationship and it goes through these shifts and changes and this Philip Larkin poem, you know, when a, you know, when a classical orchestra warm up, they tune up. Um, and it's, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like anything else in music. It's I, I love it. And he described, Philip Larkin describes it as cascades of monumental slithering. And it's one of my favorite poems. It's one of my favorite lines of poetry. And for I don't know why, but every time I hear about today, I think about this poem. And it's broadcast is two people separated 
by a space who are falling apart their relationship is is not good and um i think what matt berninger and the national do in about today is is poetry it's it, it's an equal to that poem and it, it describes in very very subtle language and looks and closeness and intimacy and hushedness it does so much with so little it's almost like the ultimate restraint song and it, yeah. it, it astonishes me that it's not on any album and you know they play it live all the time like they it's it's a staggering song of heartbreak and sadness and everything that's great about the national everything that's great about the national is in about today and that's what so, i love it i feel like um it, i feel like space invaders the cousin song of that in a slightly different <laughs> way but with the epic um third of that of the, the ending um and i feel very fortunate i'm not saying in this in any braggadocious manner I feel fortunate that when I saw them live for the first time in 2007, it was for the boxer. And then um, I didn't know there, I had no idea they were going to play that song. And I just mm -hmm. like, oh my God. And they played the full, they didn't, there was nothing cut from it. Um, so it's kind of like when U2 does uh, Bad. <laughs> yeah. Right. You want the yeah. full flavor of it. So, yeah. yeah, it really is. And, you know, you mentioned that Royal Festival Hall. Mm -hmm. um, the last time I was there was for the Cocteau Twins oh. in 94. And I'm going to make a connection to about today here in a second. Mm -hmm. So the Cocteau Twins did something similar. They released an EP that has four of the greatest Cocteau Twin songs ever. And why none of those ever made it onto albums. I almost feel like, yeah, I can see why it would bum people out. I totally get it. But I love that it just stands alone. Mm. It mm. stands alone. They caught lightning in a bottle for this one. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's epic. Okay, everyone, we have hit exactly the two hour mark. It is the final, final piece to this conversation. We are now going to rank all 10 studio albums, starting with number 10. Barkles, what is your number 10? Uh, my number 10 is the album that I do not have in my possession because it's somewhere, it's on CD. Uh, it would be the self-titled debut, The National. Um, not to have any slight on that album at all but it's it's it, it's kind of my least favorite in a in a gold standard of incredible works <laughs> it's a solid debut album uh came out in 2001 and uh thank you for sharing your number 10 because guess what that is my <laughs> number 10 as well <laughs> so uh yeah let's move on to number nine Number nine, I will go for Sad Songs for Date Lovers. Um, and again, not to say I do not really like this album, I do. It's just purely that their output is so phenomenally strong. Um, and there are there are songs on this album that mean a great deal to me. But as an album, it's not one that I would rank so highly. But it's an important album in the evolution of that band, for sure. Thank you for saying that. And guess what my number nine pick is? <laughs> there it is. There it Great is. songs on here. Trophy Wife, Lucky, <laughs> Cardinal Song. It's a great second album. And it just, it gives you a lot of glimpses of what's to come for this uh, tremendous volume of work. Okay, uh, number eight. Number eight, um, I'm going to go with a recent album. I'm going to go with Frankenstein. Oh, nice. Um, which I think is still growing on me and I'm still discovering new things. And there are songs on it which I hadn't noticed, which kind of keep creeping up on me. Um, but I think 
I think in terms of um, their sound and their body of work, um, yeah, this sits about here for me. And it's it's only an indication of how phenomenal their back catalogue is God. that I have to put it at, like, you know, number <laughs> eight. <laughs> well, guess what, my friend? I'm going to pick a new <laughs> album, too. <laughs> However, I'm going to go with Laugh Track. Uh, okay. Eight. Yeah, so, yep, I mean, uh, you're, this is what you do on your number eight. I mean, this is great, yeah. right? So, and like most of us, we're still gathering up a lot of pieces, a lot of little nuances to this album. So, yeah, number eight and uh, number seven for you. Number seven, I do not have in my possession. It is waiting at the record store for me to go and pick it up. Uh, I pre-ordered it, but it would be Laugh Track. Yay! I think, yeah, there it is. I I think as a as a counterpoint to two pages of Frankenstein, and also the fact that those songs were written at the same time, I'm still digesting them, and I. I just, I, from listening to it both relentlessly, I think the songs on Laugh Track are more me than Frankenstein, perhaps. And for that reason, I'm just going to put it slightly ahead of Frankenstein. God, this was brutal. This was like, <laughs> you know, in a, a horse race and just neck and neck. <laughs> you know, it could it could change in, in, the, in the moment of a note, right? Yeah. A guitar strum. So my number seven is we're going back to the corporate political ties. Oh, sleep well, beast. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I I read somewhere that this vinyl packaging won like awards. It's it's amazing, and I love the, it. Yeah, the the oh the blue. Oh, it's, just, it's fantastic. So that is my number seven. Hell of an album. Hell of an album. All right, number six for you. <laughs> uh, my, my number six is going to be the same. <laughs> Your number seven, my number six. Um, yeah, I I think this is a, an incredible record in their career. Yeah. Um, I I do love the cover. The cover is now iconic. I mean, it has this hyper reel. I'm like, how did Graham McIndoe take this photo and make it so majestic? And also, you're a bit like, this is their recording studio? Are you shitting me? Like, <laughs> and you can see the band. It's just gorgeous. It's like um yeah oh if i could be in a band and have a recording studio in upstate new york yeah right yeah um it has it has a kind of fairy tale quality that feeds into that sleep well beast mythology and imagery and metaphor that they are playing with and it's the packaging is just beautiful and it it fits that kind of twilight otherworldly feel that the album has definitely and yeah, and speaking of the packaging, as we mentioned, award-winning. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Lyrics right there. So that is your number six. All righty. Here is my number six. Oh, my goodness. If you're going to put on grease in your hair, <laughs> I got to go with our friend. First two pages of Frankenstein. Oh, uh... Yeah. Um, again, that's almost neck and neck with Sleep Well Beast. But uh, what a welcome back. What a what a wonderful return. <laughs> so that is my number six. All right. Top five. <laughs> oh, God. Um, OK, so this was very difficult. Um, so I'm going to go I'm going to go with Boxer. Um, now I have, I've got the live in Brussels boxer, and I have the boxer on CD. Nice. Um, this number one, this album cover is is stunning. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I was getting into the national, it kind of fed into that rich seam of Americana that, as an English 
music fan you find endlessly fascinating. Um, it looks like they're on stage at some sort of prom in the 50s or 60s. You know, it, it looks like it's from like It's a Wonderful Life or American Graffiti or something like that. And the great story behind it is they are playing Geese of Beverly Road live um, at the producer of Alligator's Wedding. I mean, how much more romance and intertextuality do you want <laughs> in in one? Uh, and it uh, and I think the band couldn't believe how good it looked when they saw the photo. Um, but yeah, in terms of top five, it pains me. It pains me to put Boxer at five. As much as I love that record, but this is where it's got to go, man. Not a bad pick. All right, top five for me. Uh, another beautiful, haunting, mysterious album cover. We're going to go back inside the mouth of the alligator. <laughs> yeah, and for many people, this was the album that started it all. And for me, I'm not going to lie, it was. This was the album. Mm -hmm that really captured my attention. And we've been over so many of these songs. So, yep, number five. Okay, number four. Number four. Um, <laughs> I am gonna go with this, which I think is, a, is actually a perfect record um, in terms of production songs. There is nothing I skip. It sustains a mood. It's a gorgeous, beautiful, troubling, strange record. And my record collection is eternally grateful that I have it. And it's got some of their greatest indie bangers. Yeah, this is this is at number four. Okay. Number four for me, another great packaging with the art. Oh. And... Uh, the beautiful colors of life and of course i'm talking about i am easy to find there we go and the beautiful clear vinyl love it yep we talked about the orchestration the cinematic qualities to it and because it has my favorite song of all time <laughs> yeah gotta go with that number four all right top three here we go bronze Okay, bronze, bronze album is going to be um, what you just ah. about. Yeah. I love how uh, we're so close. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is uh, the pack, the packaging on this artwork is beautiful. I have a slightly different version. It has three different color vinyl for each. Oh, nice. So it has red, yellow, and gray for the vinyl nice. to, to coincide with the, the colors. But, um, I, I think because of lockdown, I spent a lot more time with this album than I already, ordinarily would have done with any album. So for that reason, in lockdown, I came to love it. And I think that's also an exercise for me in what it is to be a music fan and to re-listen and to to put time into something. Um, in, the, in the Mistaken for Strangers documentary, um, Scott Devendorf, is talking about what it takes to make an album and they will spend 18 months two years with multiple people trying to get it right to give you 45 minutes <laughs> and you know every band goes through that some are faster than others but um the idea that you work and work and work to perfect something to get it right to gift it to your fans. Um, and for me, this album is something I'm still discovering new things in all the time. And I love listening to it on headphones. There's all these things in the background that I never spot and then I do. So it's, it's like a treasure chest that you just keep opening and finding new, new gifts in. It's just amazing, yeah. Solid pick. Absolutely. Okay, my number three, we're going to go back to 2007. As I mentioned, um, this was my London album. This is uh, my friend that came along with me. And of course, we're talking about. <laughs> so, yeah, Boxer. Um, 
apartment story was my gold medal track. And uh, Jesus, what an album. <laughs> From start to finish. And no, if you put these back to back, I'm not talking about in years. Mm. If you put them back to back, the tremendous leap in growth. Mm, mm. And not that they needed it. It just it organically seemed to come about with all that experience. It's it's phenomenal. Okay. Cool. Silver medal. Silver. Number Silver. two. Number number two. Number two for me is gonna have to be alligator. Um I know I know we've talked a lot about Matt's lyrics and I think what's what's also interesting is the fonts the fonts on national albums change with each album which is just fascinating in its own right you know when a band creates an identity they often have a font or a logo or you know and the fact that the national keep shape-shifting they keep changing they keep evolving and they do that they do that with the album um fonts that they use and the typography and the design and yeah uh for me lyrically lyrically for me this is their best album i i don't think i've ever heard anybody nail what it's like to be in your 20s living in a city trying to navigate all the complexities of that maybe with the exception of elliot smith um but i think yeah this this is one of the peerless albums of that era because when i remember when you were listening the albums that were, the albums that were coming out at that time and this sounds nothing like anything it sounds like nothing like any of those albums and That's it's right. only it's only in retrospect you come to realize how they were beating their own path at that time and what bravery and what what uh, confidence that took um, and and what a journey it's taken them on. Yeah, um, beautifully said. My number two album, <laughs> I just realized <laughs> was at my girlfriend's house as we were listening on vinyl. And um, I do have the CD somewhere. Maybe it's it right here. Oh, here it is. <laughs> uh, hey. This is my number two. Um, a seductive collection of subtly state, uh, surging anti-anthems. A lush and primordial triumph. The national is in a league of its own. Not one mediocre track here. No. Great to mind-boggling, jaw-dropping, amazing. Um, and I love this has the expanded edition on it. Mm. And uh, yeah, this. Um, yeah, this always takes me back to a, a particular class that um, we had one of the great I had one of the greatest years of teaching and I listened to this album nonstop. So, yeah, I'm going with high violet <laughs> and I love the purple and the silver. So. Yeah. All righty. Your numero uno. <laughs> well, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure you might have already realized, uh, yeah, um, I've probably already spoken enough on this album, but uh, I iconic cover. Um, I think I think it's important to also acknowledge albums, you know, truly great albums. Do they have great album covers because they're great albums or do you see the album cover in a different light because the music is so good? But I think the great albums have both, you know. Um, and I think this this kind of colourful, messy, messy knot of complications and mess and contradictions and just chaos, it just sums up what I think Matt's mind might have been at the time and definitely what my mind was when I was going through a very difficult period in my life and and this album to some extent saved my life and I think this album is a it's a testament to to what music can do creatively 
but also what it can do to save you and to to ease your mental pain and your emotional pain because somebody else feels the same way. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a staggering achievement that people will be listening to in a, in a hundred years time for sure. It's one of the albums that I feel as though um, scholars should be, you know, using their their oral surgeon t tools to really pick apart and to just kind of go through the minefields of that and figure out, wow, this is yeah. uh, this is an amazing this is amazing piece of work. Yeah. And when you think about it, that term term opus, I think that uh, readily applies. All right. Well, my number one is um, an album that when I listened to it last week, I almost had to turn it off because, as I mentioned earlier, it's just the album that it, it clobbers me. It, it, it gives me black eyes and heavy hearts. And it just came about in a time period in my life where I was um, trapped and feeling suffocated. And really by my own doings, really by my own doings. And going back to that whole idea of, um, we've talked about universally, universally with his ability to get us to think about our, our own behavior and to question it. And this is the album that as dark as it is, as heavy it is, it kind of brings in new light. And it, it was the mirror to which I can always say change had to happen in my life and change did happen. So if I ever meet them, I'm going to tell them, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that is my, my, my gold medal. Aww. Okay. Holy smokes. What a mountain we have climbed everyone. Uh, Barkles, Giorgio, you, like last time, you get the final say here. Any parting words, last minute thoughts? Um, purely, purely that I'm 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 so glad that I'm a, I'm alive at this same time as this band. You know, um, so many musicians and bands that I've loved. I know we we you know you talk about Joy Division. And um, I, I never got a chance to see them live, but the, you know the the mythology is that everybody that saw Joy Division formed a band, you know. Um, but luckily, we are alive to see the bands that that band influenced, and we've seen that band evolve and become totally unique. Um, you know, growing up, REM were a huge, huge deal. They were on the radio all the time. I know that you know the national supported REM, and Michael Stipe has recently been backstage and hanging out with them on this tour. And there's a and um, in not in Kansas anymore. You know, um, he says I've been listening to REM again, and there's a, there's a great intertextuality and a feeding, feeding into tapping into that great American rock story. Um, but what what i think is so great about the national is if if you hold them up and there is no one that sounds like them like you know and a lot of that is down to matt and his voice and his baritone the minute you hear it the minute you hear matt singing you know it's matt you know um and the richness the evolution the development and the endless exploration of this band is part of what it makes being a national fan is what it gives you so much joy um you know what a body of work to, to constantly dive into and and revisit yeah. and um you look at it, that in the context of what they do for charities and causes that they feel strongly about and the community of fans and musicians and collaborators that they take on their way. And I think that sense of community and humanity and music, music is something that brings people together. And you feel, you just feel proud to be a national fan because 
there's something that is so inspiring and um, loving that you, you know, they give so much to their fans. And they are one of the hardest touring bands you're ever going to see. And I think what they give, we give back in many ways. But what a band. So I would say for me, my closing words, um, I'm going to go with uh, brevity on this one because I think from it, we've said so much, we've unpacked so much about their, their body of work and how impactful it's been on our lives. But I think when it's all said and done, when I'm ready to leave this earth and God had been happy for a long, long time, you, you just said it. I'm so glad for, or I'm alive. And um, that's kind of eerie that you said that because just last week, just last week, I was sitting listening to a national song and I texted my girlfriend and I literally said, I don't want to die. That's it. And I don't want to die for so many reasons. And I know music is really a, a life preserver for me. And um, I, it's, it's, it's going to be so painful to leave this earth and not have this fall along with me. I'm guessing. What do I know? Well, but, hey, they have a song about that <laughs> for you. Uh, the day I die. <laughs> <laughs> the day I die, the day I die, where will I be? Um, I and I, I think that taps into nobody knows when they're gonna go. You gotta, you gotta make the most of the time that you have. You gotta love your friends, love your family, because at the end of the day, that's all you got, and you got music. And yeah, yeah yes, and I concur with all that. But I also feel what I've learned so much about this band, as well as others, it's like. Don't be afraid to go into the darkness. Mm. There's, there's, there is, there are magnificent intrinsic revelations that happen, and it's hard to be there. It's hard, hard, hard to swallow that jagged little pill. But <laughs> man, it is, it's, it's worth the journey. So, Barcos Giorgio, this has been a tremendous honor. Thank you oh, so much. Yeah for uh, gifting me with all of your words and all of your thoughts and expressions on this magnificent band. And maybe one day we'll get to see them together. Who knows? Uh, everyone, my name is W, host of the High Art on the Edge page. Thank you again for tuning in as a massive tribute to uh, the band, The National. And of course, thank you to The National for all of your incredible, inspiring work. Take care, everyone. Keep listening to great music. It's always out there. Always. <laughs> Ciao.